all by itself, the heart of man, though he doesn't know how it happens, it begins to change on the inside of him, day and night. First the blade, the stalk, and it begins to change. Nothing's really changed yet, but it's growing. There is a point in time when there is agreement between the seed that's in the head and the seed that was sown from heaven. When that seed matches the seed that was sown, faith, agreement. And when there's agreement and there's faith, then the man puts the sickle in and receives what heaven says. Welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie. Behind me are the ripe fields in Ohio. It is harvest season and this field is about to be harvested. Harvest season is the fun time of year. That's when you get to collect and make money from all of the labor through the preceding months. Harvest season is good, kind of like payday. Well, everyone doesn't enjoy harvest season because they don't have harvest season. Maybe they don't understand the laws of harvest season or maybe they don't know where to sow or how the process even works. But if you ask any farmer, he's pretty well convinced of the laws that govern the harvest. I want you to take a look back with me to Egypt in the days of the Bible. Back in Joseph's day, you might remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. There was a severe famine. All the crops, all the crops were ruined. No, nothing grew at all for seven years. But in the midst of this famine, there was one spot that had grain piles so massive and so big they couldn't even count or keep track of the harvest. How did that happen? Joseph, in charge of the grain piles in Egypt, did something astounding in a severe famine, having more grain than he could even count or store. Well, today on Fixing the Money Thing, we're gonna look at the harvest and try to dig into the story. Why was there a huge pile of grain amidst a severe famine? How did it get there? How would it change your life if you had access to a grain pile yourself? Today on Fixing the Money Thing. From Faith Life Church in New Albany, Ohio, Gary Cassie brings a message of success and overwhelming abundance. The Grain Pile Principle Series, today on Fixing the Money Thing. We are starting a brand new series, a four week series, on uh, about, about the seed, the harvest, how things work. But we're going to talk about Joseph. So I want you to get your pencils out. I believe this series is going to help you immensely. I said immensely. It's going to help you. <laughs> Joseph wasn't a normal guy. We're going to talk about him. And so who knows who Joseph is in the Bible? Book of Genesis. Back Adam and Eve, of course, we know they ruled the earth. They lost the kingdom. They lost the provision. They lost the garden. Adam sinned. God had to find a, another man that he could bring his government to bear in the earth realm through. That man's name was Abram, later to become Abraham. Abraham made covenant with God. Covenant means a legal agreement between two parties, which gave heaven an open door into the earth realm. In fact, I didn't make that term up. Genesis chapter 12, the Bible says, through that door of Abraham's legal agreement, Jesus would come through that door. All right, so... Abraham had kids, and his lineage, Abraham's lineage, is the lineage where this legality passed from generation to generation to generation, and was the lineage that Jesus Christ walked through. That's why the first book in the New Testament is the book of genealogy, because in the earth realm, it proves to Satan that Jesus was legally of the heir of Abraham, and thus legal to walk into the earth realm. Follow me? It's a boring chapter, right? The first book of Matthew, he begets so-and-so, begets so-and-so, begets so-and-so. It's not boring to Satan because he hates it. <laughs> because Jesus Christ is legal to come through that door. All right. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We're going to talk about Joseph in this story because it's a remarkable story about Joseph that we want to talk about. Joseph came from a large family, and of course, he's the great-grandson of Abraham, but there were some issues in the family. His brothers hated him, literally, wanted to kill him, tried to kill him. How many say that might be a dysfunctional family? <laughs> All right, so, that's right. So he came from a dysfunctional family, issue family. 
they sold him. They eventually sold him to the Ishmaelites. There were traders coming through. They sold their own brother into slavery. So Joseph had serious, could have had serious rejection issues. Would you agree? He was sold into slavery with no future. He worked for a man named Potiphar and did a fantastic job running Potiphar's estate. But his wife accused him of raping her, and he was thrown into prison falsely. So he has a major disloyalty issue that he has to deal with because he meant them good. He was helping Potiphar and now finds himself in prison. You could be bitter about that, right? Genesis chapter 43 says regarding the Hebrews that they were detested by the Egyptians. In fact, they did not, Egyptians were not allowed to eat with Hebrews. So he wasn't the right skin color, if you will. He wasn't the right race. So he had all this family dysfunction, disloyalty in his history. He had all of these issues. He had no hope. He's in a prison cell, life sentence, no way to get out, but something happened. Genesis chapter 41, verse 41 says this. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt, the mightiest nation on the face of the earth, Joseph stands before Pharaoh. Pharaoh took his own signet ring from his own finger and puts it on Joseph's finger, meaning he had the same authority Pharaoh did. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. People shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. How many would agree that is quite a story? This guy is in prison one day. <laughs> Pharaoh calls him out of prison. They shave him and bathe him, bring him before Pharaoh, and he's set in place to rule the entire nation. Now, if you are a spiritual scientist, your first thought would be, how did that happen? And so the religious answer would be, well, God did it. No, no. There was no believers amongst his fellowship. Pharaoh knew, did not know God. Potiphar didn't know God. There was no one there that would say, hey, because you're an Israelite, because you love God, let me promote you. They only promoted him on the basis of what he did and who he was. So we can look at the principles that he demonstrated and we can find principles that will exalt your life and promote your life as well. Is that making sense? Yeah. So let's begin our story in Genesis 39. There are a few texts that I'm going to read today that are a little longer than normal, but I believe they're important for the story that lay the foundation for the series. Genesis chapter 39, verse number one. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, that's when his brother sold him to the Ishmaelites. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he what? He what? Is the Lord with you? I am Gary Cassie, and you will never fulfill your destiny until you fix your money thing. Visit GaryCassie.com, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button below for more amazing weekly videos on fixing your money thing, and thanks for watching.